good evening and a very warm welcome to all of you on the cbps annual endowment lecture on budgets as you all know i mean elections in karnataka was a big thing and it was debated all over the country not just because of its different kind of thing but its manifesto was something that became very talk of the town it is not just a manifesto they came up with what is known as guarantees with uh, those guarantees being signed by uh, kpcc president and also uh, leader of the opposition the then leader of the opposition sidaramaiah they signed and kind of assured kind of thing as these guarantees be provided by them once if they are back in power so this in a way elevated the very kind of manifestos to a different level that is one part uh, so elections happened they won and they are in power now and they announced that all these guarantees would be fulfilled as they have promised in the very first cabinet meeting they said that an approval has been given for all of them and last week 7th of july sidaramaiah who is also the chief minister presented the budget so many spoke about this whether these kind of guarantees i mean which would amount to close to 60000 crores will it be a fiscal strain on the state of finances is it a good move and there was also discussion saying that this is a good welfare move putting money into the pockets of the people at this kind of distress times sidaramaiah also in his budget speech said that this is also kind of uh, universal income kind of thing putting into putting money to 1.3 crore families of the state so uh, discussions are on both sides whether there were like whether these guarantees will be honored what kind of allocations would be made as we all know from the budget for all of these uh, five guarantees at least four of them have clear allocations being made in the budget like uh, annabagya or the uh, gruha lakshmi or the shakti which is the transport facilities for women as against expected thing uh, actually the ridership in the buses have increased and women have uh, traveling more and there was an increase in the revenues for first 5 6 days as it was reported so it is high time to understand what these guarantees these kind of guarantees would do is it a good move i mean it was a big political move as i said it would definitely take this entire manifestos into a different level altogether so uh, we have with us sri sanjay kol i welcome you sir uh, sir former ias officer of karnataka kd uh, been actively engaged in development policy in the past a decade and a half after his uh, service and um, he recently uh, launched his book uh, which is uh, an alternative developmental agenda for india which speaks about the plausible solutions for this developmental issues without compromising on fiscal challenges this is something very important it is very apt that we have him here for this uh, uh, his reflections on this budget of karnataka for the year 23 24 i welcome you sir please please sir i welcome you no i request sri krishna kumar who was former additional chief secretary to government of karnataka an experienced bureaucrat three decades experience across uh, various departments agriculture water resources urban development and with his experience uh, he is very apt to share this session and i hand it over to you sir for your opening remarks now so to handle this session thank you huh? yeah this mic
good evening friends uh, i'm happy to be with uh, all of you this evening to listen to uh, sanjay uh, sanjay is a recently minted author and uh, the ripples following the release of his book recently at the bic are still doing the rounds in academia and in intellectual circles in and around bangalore and uh, he is now going to sort of uh, apply the framework that he has developed and initiated in his book uh, to a very specific economic document namely the budget of the government of karnataka for 2324 uh, i am as keen as uh, all of you are to uh, see how uh, the dissection happens uh, uh, and what lessons and what inputs uh, we can get from him on how this budget could have been dif done differently or going forward how future budgets in karnataka uh, could be framed uh, in, uh, within a larger uh, framework and even more uh, importantly i think with elections to three state governments coming off in the next 2 3 months would there be any lessons from the karnataka poll verdict followed by the budget uh, which provides for a funds these guarantees what could rajasthan chatisgarh and madhya pradesh be doing and so on so there are a lot of interesting things to look forward to in sanjay so without much uh, delay let me request sanjay to address all of us and uh, presume that uh, most of us have not read his book thank you sir uh, mr krishna kumar dr jyotsna jha and we are privileged that the actual author of the budget the additional chief chief secretary of finance atik is here with us i also would like to welcome my senior colleagues mr sudhakar rao mr abhay prakash narsim raju shrinivas and all the board members of cbps for joining us today in this discussion and i'm hoping that after what i have said what i will have some time for some responses from uh, from all of you so as uh, madhur sanjay pointed out in the beginning this budget has a lot of political significance and electoral significance uh, and therefore it was my truly my privilege to receive this invitation to deliver this year's lecture and i am grateful to cbps for giving me this opportunity in the past two the parties voted to par had made several electoral promises during the campaign and in their manifestos however it is perhaps quite rare that specific guarantees that were promised uh, were committed and have been implemented at least through cabinet decisions almost within 24 hours of the government coming to par of course the people at large and people across the country would be judging to the extent to which these promises are realized through adequate allocations and issuance of actual orders uh, for the rollout both in letter and spirit with specific dates here marked for the launch as some of the guarantees have been given those dates and as madhusudan also pointed out the specific the rollout successfully of these promises has country wide ramifications much uh, beyond karnataka Uh, on other st uh, state governments and it will put pressure on other state governments uh, to implement promises made in their manifestos whether it will bring them uh, bring some amount of seriousness in the commitments we we will yet to uh, see that so karnataka's state will be judged not only from the quality of governance and its commitment to the promises but also for the development strategy that it puts in place in comparison to states where the ruling party is in power in that sense the credibility of the new government 
and indeed of the opposition as a whole is also at stake. So, so the Karnataka budget is not, not an ordinary state budget. It is going to be watched very, very carefully across the country. So of course, I would be evaluating the five promises, but alongside, as uh, the chair alluded, I would be ad addressing some vital human development and livelihood issues that matter most to people. And I will examine whether they find a place in the budget or are conspicuous in their absence. Let me begin by quoting not Atik but Sidramaya, uh, budget speech which seeks to spell out what I think is the government's approach to development policy. And I quote, budget is not merely an exercise in the management of finance. It is an instrument to spell out priorities and objectives and realize them. While formulating the budget for the year, the state government has taken a conscious call to devise programs which are fact-based, outcome-oriented, and pro-people welfare schemes by reconciling demands with ground realities and sustainable development. So this is certainly a very laudatory kind of statement and does provide a great vision uh, for the government. However, the, as the adage goes, the devil lies in the details. And I propose to analyze whether this intent has actually been realized both through budgetary provisions as well as policy commitments made in the budget speech. However, my intention is not mostly to critique the budget. But I would be suggesting, within the fiscal constraints, a few practical solutions to further the, this objective and vision of this new government. Unfortunately, Chair, sir, the budget analysis is ordinarily a very dry kind of exercise. And I, therefore, uh, would be confining my analysis to only some main budget provisions and focus more on issues that this exercise has thrown up. In uh, looking at the July budget, it's also useful to compare it with the budget which was presented just four months earlier, in February. And we'll find that now the budget total is pegged at 3.28 like, uh, crores. It's a good 19,000 crores more than the one presented in February. And the revenue receipts are expected to be 2.38, with the capital, at 50, capital receipts at 54,000 crores. So the capital expenditure is about 7,000 crores lower than what had been projected. But I'm actually surprised, pleasantly surprised, that it is not much lower. Because all the commitments and promises are going to be in the nature of revenue expenditure. Uh, as much as 52,000 crores has been estimated as a budget requirement. And the chief minister has provided some indicative allocations for each of these promises. Uh, the largest chunk, of course, is the Guru Lakshmi scheme which is the benefit transfer to women heads at about 30,000 crores. Uh, you get about Groa Jyoti has been allocated about 14,000 crores, the Anna Bhagya 10,000 crores, and the Shakti electricity, free electricity scheme about 4,000 crores. There's no specific mention in the budget for the Yuvan Nidhi scheme, but the budget documents seem to indicate that allocation is around 250 crores. Atik will uh, clarify that. Uh, 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 if I'm wrong. Now, if you add them up, they, in a full year, they add up to about 60,000. And perhaps since we have only nine months in the year, 52,000 crores appears like a good estimate. Uh, the budget is, the chief minister has got three measures to mop up this additional sources of revenue. The first is through the excise duty on liquor. The second is by, by uh, reviewing the guidance value on properties and uh, shoring up the revenues of stamps and registration, and also uh, by additional borrowing, uh, which is going to be about 85,000 crores, about 8,000 crores more than what had been presented. Uh, the Chief Minister has also fixed a little 10,000 crore higher target for GST collections, which appears reasonable based on the first two, three months collections and a buoyant uh, source of uh, uh, the previous five years, GST revenues have actually gone up by 50%. And uh, the, 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 it's quite reasonable to expect that from 90,000 crores, which was the earlier estimate, that the, the government should be able to garner 1 lakh crores, which is now what is projected for GST. In overall sense, therefore, the uh, 
both in terms of GST collection estimates as well as the projected estimates in the state's revenues, the, the figures appear quite credible. And uh, uh, there this should be able to be no difficulty in mopping up the 3.28 lakh crores which the government has said it would. Now what about the fiscal deficit? Uh, that, that's about 66,000 crores against a state income of 25 lakh plus crores. This works out about 2.5, 2.6% 2 2 of the GSDP, which again is within the Fiscal Responsibility Act. So there again, it seems to be uh, reasonably well managed. So there was therefore apprehension that the financial health of the state would be severely compromised due to the implementation of the five guarantees. And as we've seen, this does not prima facie appear to have taken place. Overall, the Chief Minister appears to have been rather smart in managing the finances of these guarantees. Uh, this does not mean that the state will not face multiple challenges. A major difficulty is that with these guarantees, the state will have limited space to take on new initiatives or projects. Further, and this is a sector which I have been working on, the fiscal space to increase outlays in social and development sectors will remain become limited. This could be justified if the five guarantees will themselves address the key issues of development and uh, social welfare, especially for poor households, and pr if they promote inclusive development. We'll examine whether, to some extent at least, this is the case. Apart from this requirement of commitments for guarantees, the government also has a lot of committed expenditure. And based on past estimates, I estimate that about 50% of its revenue receipts will have to be earmarked for committed expenditure. This would include about 25% odd on salaries, 15% on interest payments, and another 15% on pensions. I may be a little wrong because these are guest, guest estimates. But broadly, uh, what we find also is that the budget itself highlights that apart from these commitments, about 2.5 lakh crores is the pending amounts required to complete ongoing projects. Uh, another important issue, and I don't know how Atik will manage that, the February budget had announced more than 100 new schemes and given specific budget allocations. Now, budget, this July budget is really silent on what has happened to those schemes. So have they been abandoned? Have they been merged with other schemes? We really don't know. Uh, and I suppose at some point we will get clarity on what the, the February announcements, because there's a large number of announcements. Please remember the February was also just before the elections, so the Chief Minister had made a lot of pre-election promises and announcements. So the sectoral breakup of the budget across sectors need to be therefore looked at uh, in the context of these commitments. Education gets the largest chunk of 11%, but most of this will be on teacher salaries. Women and child and energy have been provided 7%, housing, urban development and irrigation, about 6%, rural development, Panchayati Raj, uh, home and transport, home and transport because of the free bus travel scheme, uh, gets a fairly large chunk of 6%, uh, 5%, and of the major sectors, other major sectors, health and uh, social welfare, food, again because of the Anabhya Bhagya scheme, uh, public works and agriculture get about 3%. And the balance, about 30%, is cuts across other sectors of the uh, government. So the point I wish to make is that the fiscal space to either hike allocations to health or women and child or any of aspirational departments is going to be limited. So we are going to be stuck for some time with these sectoral allocations. So all you can do is find ways to tweak allocations within the sector, but not expect that there will be huge increases in the future across these sectoral allocations. The, 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 the bulk of the expenditure would be either committed or linked to central sponsored schemes or required for financing the guarantees. And therefore, the Chief Minister has been fairly prudent. Actually, if you notice the budget speed, not a single new major project has been. Some schemes have been announced, but no major project has been announced. But if you go by the vision of the Chief Minister, and I'll, I'll keep on coming back to that, his objective and vision is to create an environment of inclusive development. And therefore we ask, 
has the chief minister been able to give any direction in fulfilling this vision and this larger objective that he has set out for this new government? And I believe, and that's what my book was planning to demonstrate, that even within fiscal constraints, you can re-engineer schemes to improve outcomes. And I intend giving some practical solutions to Atik and his colleagues in the finance department of how that is possible. And it's very important to do this because we have seen that sectoral allocations are going to be limited. There is going to be not much space to enhance outlays even in the next couple of years. So the basically, what are the sectors that I'll be looking at? I won't be covering all the sectors. Certainly critical sectors of income, employment, and poverty, uh, education, food security and nutrition, health, the situation of women and children, and urban infrastructure. So we will evaluate to where, what extent the budget has been able to look at reforms or identify, it, as it says it will, cost-effective measures to improve outcomes. Uh, to improve outcomes and improve the quality of life of people. So let's first look at income growth, income growth, employment, and poverty. The state has witnessed across governments a fairly robust GSDB growth of something, in fact, more than 8% in most years, except for one year, one and a half years of the COVID pandemic. Uh, there's also been stability in the economic and business environment across governments. So we don't really see in terms of business environment things have changed. It would be therefore to e reasonable to expe uh, expect that the prospects of income growth augurs well, uh, are robust and augurs well for the state's finances as well. But there are some concerns which have emerged in Karnataka. While the state's per capita income has improved rapid rapidly and Karnataka has most of one of the highest per capita incomes in the state, there are two worrying signs. First, this growth has not translated into better outcomes in human development indicators such as education, health, and child nutrition. For example, 35% of young children in Karnataka are stunted. And on this parameter, for instance, Karnataka ranks 24th out of 30 states. So it's the top three in terms of per capita incomes were 24th when it comes to child nutrition. Similarly, Karnataka, and that is because of some of the northern districts, has the highest child marriages anywhere in the country. And anywhere I include states like Rajasthan. So the second worrisome sign is that not only are human development indicators poor, but they vary hugely across regions and states. And this has historically been true. And we have not been able to redress the balance. So if you take income, for instance, districts like Ch uh, Chikmaglu, Dakshin Kannada, um, Mysore, Udupi, have per capita incomes of over 3 lakhs, whereas the northern and Belgam districts have income per capita incomes, uh, uh, districts like Bidar, uh, Bagalkot, Kopal, Haveri, Yadgir, and Vijaypura have per capita incomes less than half, less than one and a half lakhs. So that is the kind of divide that you see. In human development indicators, also you have huge high divergence. So for instance, I checked up the NFHS data, Yadgir has 57% of children who are stunted. So which means almost two out of three children are stunted. Uh, similarly, in Vijaypur and Bagalkot, more than all close to 48%, 40% of marriages were to teenagers. So hence, the challenge to the new government is not only to boost incomes, but also improve social indicators and reduce the wide variance across regions of the state. So from income, if you move to employment, the budget makes a statement that the government would promote employment opportunities by ensuring rapid growth of industries and increasing the employability of the youth. But it ends there. I, have, I could not spot any measure either to promote employment or improve employability of the youth. If there is only one specific measure that it will facilitate business environment and one specific measure that two, two acres would be permitted uh, without conversion for setting up businesses. I may have missed out some fine print in the budget speech. Historically, Karnataka has been an att attractive in, uh, destination for in investments in industry. You have the IT boom here. You have automobiles, pharma, and plantation industries, which have done very well. 
And there is, now this is where I think some policy thrust could have taken place. There is evidence globally, and this, if you read my book, I have sp uh, fleshed it out. There is a lot of evidence that well-designed and well-planned manufacturing clusters around towns and cities gather a critical mass of interconnected companies and institutions and act as a magnet for, st for other businesses to grow. And this is a, perhaps the only reason why the IT industry has boomed. So you not only had edu educational institutions, the, the one set of in uh, IT units also spawned others. Now, therefore, the state can provide the thrust to accelerate the development of what I call industrial manufacturing clusters outside Bangalore as well. And you have potentially large number of such potential magnets. It could be Ma uh, Mangalore, Hubli, Dharwad, Belgaum, Mysore, to name a few. The budget provided op opportunity to the government not to announce um, uh, allocations, but at least to announce a proactive industrial policy focusing on promoting manufacturing clusters in these potential identified clusters. So though Bangalore has been given thrust, as we, as we will discuss a little later, uh, the same priority does, does not seem to have been accorded to other cities. We next turn our attention to addressing poverty. There is a considerable evidence that across the country, and including in Karnataka, the COVID pandemic may have actually led to exacerbated levels of poverty. Uh, the Annabhagya scheme and the free electricity schemes could in some sense be described be described as helping poor households. The free bus travel scheme is also, in a sense, self-targeting, because obviously well-off women do not ordinarily use the, the uh, public bus transport. And to the extent that the other two guarantees also provide relief to households, they would contribute to making a dent in poverty. However, my issue with the government is not of welfare and uh, relief, but what has been done to actually promote livelihoods of people. I could not find mention of any, op any initiative for income generation or employment uh, creation which is specifically targeted for poor households. Let us now turn our discussion from the broad areas of income, employment, and poverty to uh, some sectoral, sectoral areas. And with the permission of the chair, I will be spending a little extra time on education, because those are So I was told between 45 minutes to an hour, so uh, I'll speak for about 45 minutes. Sure. So let us look at the budgetary provisions for education. At 11%, one cannot complain that the allocations have not been adequate. But where have the budgets talked about the enhanced allocations? It's been basically on two accounts. One, uh, it has been on a lot of more classrooms, toilets, maintenance of infrastructure, in the supply side of education. Uh, and in the last decade or so, the quality of both school and college infrastructure from the time that I was commissioner and secretary of education has improved dramatically. The worry is that this improvement in school infrastructure has not translated into improvements of school performance or improvements in the learning levels of children. And you have successive Pratham and Acer surveys showing that uh, children, even after class five, are barely able to read and write. So therefore, the budget should have at least given some indication on focusing on learning outcomes. And it has actually done so. Uh, there is a new program called the Kalike Balwardhane program uh, to address learning deficiencies. And there is also a, another program announced with zero budget from what I could make out on uh, preparing students for sec secondary level, level examinations. However, the budget allocation for these two initiatives is about 80 crores, against which 750 crores is for infrastructure. Now, look at another scheme, and that is the supplementary nutrition once a week for classes 9 and 10, which have been provided 280 crores. Now, if you look at calorie energy deficits, they come down as, as the child grows up. And in any case, it cannot be anybody's case that you're giving supplementary nutrition once a week is going to really radically change outcomes. So had this 280 crores 
been focused on learning outcomes, improving, uh, say, teacher training or, uh, 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 or things which directly affect learning levels, it could have been better utilized. And government schools really face a major crisis. The disconnect between what the teacher is teaching and what the where the learning levels of students, there's a huge divide. And that is basically because children from poor households are, cannot identify the curriculum of the NCRT or the state government. They are at a different level because they do not have a learning environment at home. And there is evidence that some amount of remedial instruction can radically improve outcomes of poor households. And there are studies by NGOs which have de demonstrated that. The same school teacher or the same tutor could do that. So, th so the solution which I am recommending is that if you use these unemployed graduates, not just to give them unemployment doles, but give them an additional 1,000, 2,000, engage them as tutors and preferably women uh, in the village to provide remedial instruction to, to students from government schools, it could actually uh, be a scheme which is not very costly. This 280 crores for this class 1, 9, and 10 uh, nutrition could have been better used to giving that incentive. And it would enhance the dignity of these employment graduates because I don't think these graduates are so thrilled of getting this kind of doles. So basically, the focus has to be in the school system, focusing on foundation levels, focusing on teacher training, and focusing on three subjects which continue to be very weak, science, math, and English. So the, obviously, the, the, the government has talked about a new education policy, and this is perhaps the opportunity for the government to frame, flesh out what this new education policy will be, how will it be different from the national education policy of the central government. There's, of course, another way that, uh, in, in my experience of many decades back, that school performance can improve, uh, which does not require any money at all, which is imp introducing transparency in the recruitment, teachers, postings of teachers, posting of education officers and DDPIs. It could dramatically improve the school management and improve outcomes. Just two more minutes on education. The higher education, what happens? We must ask why our educated youth is not getting jobs and why this Yuvanidhi scheme was really required. One major reason could be that there are no adequate job opportunities. But when you speak to private firms, and I spent about 14 years in the private sector, they also point out that many graduates and diploma holders are just not employable. So should the budget not have given a thrust to reviewing what is going wrong with our colleges and what kind of graduates we are thrusting out and address gaps in skills and knowledge. So the Yuva Didi seems to be a tacit admission that the state may not be in a position to provide jobs to this mass of educated youth. But the effort must be to make these youth employable and expand employment opportunities. Unfortunately, so far, we have not seen the budget giving that vision. There is therefore a need to engage with private employers and firms, identify gaps, and ensure that the higher education institutions provide students with the necessary know-how to successfully make the most of the job opportunities, not only within Karnataka, but even outside. And as someone who's worked in the private sector for 14 years, I can assert that there is no dearth of job opportunities for students with the right knowledge and skills. So in the budget has actually identified one gap that, uh, uh, that graduates face. And this is their rud rudimentary knowledge of English. In this context, the budget announcement that conversational in English will be started in all government higher education institutions is a good initiative. Unfortunately, Atik has not provided any budget for it. Or at least I couldn't see it. It, it is a good initiative, but without any budget provisions. So we now move. Uh, sorry for taking this from this rather longish discussion in education to discussing the situation of women. And admittedly, a key barrier to women's access was due to inadequate and unsafe transport. Uh, there is already evidence that the free bus travel scheme has improved mobility of women. And it is also, as we mentioned, well-targeted 
as it is only poor women who will be using the government bus systems. I, however, see two major risks in this scheme. Expanding public transport through augmenting the bus fleet and improving quality should have remained a priority for the bus transport undertakings. Uh, unfortunately, that might not happen because if the budgets are earmarked for this Uchit uh, uh, free travel scheme, uh, we may not, they may not have the wherewithal to actually augment the feet or improve their quality. Especially if the dues are not, not reimbursed to the transport undertakings in time. So there is actually a thrust which requires to be given for public transport and to augmenting and expanding the bus fleet, which this uh, scheme may come in the, as, as a barrier. So in the context of public transport, I'd like to make one or two more comments. And this is, a, again, something which I flesh out in the book. Is bus transport not a more cost-effective way than the more expensive, capex-intensive metro systems? Uh, if you look at the budget, it has proposed two major lines. A metro two line, 45 kilometers, which will cost about 16,000 crores, uh, from Kempapura to JP Nagar, and another line of 37 kil kilometers from he Hebal to Sarjapura at a cost of 15,000 crores. As I mentioned, for those of you who were there at the discussion, by limiting this metro line just by five kilometers, we can actually induct into the city 2,000 Volvo buses, which will change the entire landscape of the public transport system uh, and, in fact, provide women uh, a much safer and more comfortable uh, a way to travel. The second uh, scheme targeted to women is the Grow Lakshman scheme, which would pro provide assistance uh, every month to every woman of the household, about 2,000 rupees a month. The, the government has clarified that the scheme would also be applicable for ASHA workers, Anganwadi workers, midday meal uh, assistants, uh, former Devdasis and gender minorities, and this wide coverage is very welcome. There's no doubt that this transfer would improve the decision-making power of the households. However, this impact of this cash transfer will obviously depend on how this household uses this money. And here, I think what the government needs to do is to engage with households, not in a peripheral, superficial sense, but in a very intensive campaign to ensure that households use this money say, for instance, improving health, nutrition, and food of the household. And that could radically improve the maternal health, child health, and nutrition, which has been suffering a lot in Karnataka, at least in large parts of the state. So, so, and at the broader level, if gender and women's empowerment is to become a major fo focus of this new government, then obviously much more will have to be done. And cash transfers can only be the first step. You have to break gender stereotypes, which calls for intensive, sustained, uh, countrywide sensitization campaigns by the government, including sharing evidence of the positive contribution of women. The sensitization campaigns have to go down to the gram panchayat level. And they, need not be, they should not be seen as peripheral uh, to the program. So cash transfer it is linked to an intensive community engagement of how to spend that money would make this translate from a freebie into a really income transfer which radically improves the health and well-being of the household. So in, in summary, my own assessment is that these schemes have the potential to be looked upon as schemes to transform livelihoods rather than as freebies. But in order to do that, you have to support them, complement them with some awareness and education campaigns so that the money is well spent. And that should, this additional money on IEC or communication should not be looked at as integral to the scheme. It should be uh, as separate from the scheme but as integral to it. So I'm also happy that on the women and child, there's another uh, good initiative which has been taken by the government and that is, which acts as a barrier for women to access the workspace. I'm referring in Karnataka, the absence of a suitable support system for childcare. And this is one scheme which was announced in the February budget, and I'm happy that this 4,000 childcare centers 
has fine specific mention in this July budget as well. Of course, it would be leveraging largely the Narega funds. So the, uh, the cash transfer has been praised by several economists because it reduces the leakage of funds. But the government should be mindful that in some cases, it, is, it is, runs the risk of wrong identification of households and a wrong enumeration. And if caution is not exercised right now, there's a risk of vested interest coming in, entering the arena, leading to fake and inaccurate beneficiary lists being prepared. This is what happened, for instance, in the two rupee scheme, where you had beneficiaries which were 30, 40% more than the number of households. Let us now briefly discuss the contentious Anabhagya scheme. And contentious because it had a political dimension where the government of India refused to give grain to the state government. But there is mounting evidence that grain supply alone in India has not solved the problem of malnourishment. And even without the Anabhagya, the state government had been allocating sizable amounts for serial PDS in addition to the central allocations. And there is therefore now time to focus on why levels of malnutrition are high amongst children, women, and men. And that leads to not just calorie deficit, but other food deprivation aspects, such as lack of vitamins, lack of fat, lack of diet diversity. And there are cost-effective ways to improve nutrition outcomes. For example, 25% of men and women in, in Karnataka are anemic. And just introduction or promotion of green leafy vegetables, iron supplements can change that picture. Uh, even under the ICDS scheme, there is evidence that supplementary nutrition alone is not really tackling uh, the issue of malnutrition amongst children. So actually I see the inability of the state government to access central gain, grain or to sources from outside, they're trying from Chhattisgarh, I'm told, may be actually a blessing in disguise. Because this cash transfer, if it is used to address the issue of nutritional imbalance amongst households, promote households to move in, use this food, uh, cash transfer for food, which is outside cereals, it could dramatically improve the nutritional uh, uh, and f f f f f f uh, outcomes of households and improve health outcomes as well. In sum, if you use this unemployment dole of, to unemployed graduates uh, for tuitions and to spread the message to households, engage them as child and healthcare workers, asking them to spread the message by giving them, in addition to this 3,000 rupees, maybe 1,000, 2,000 rupees, get them to go to households, th this will actually serve a, a, a much greater outcomes than simply giving cash transfer without this communication and messages of how this money will be used. There are other cost-effective solutions to impact nutrition, education, and health. Uh, and using these uh, uh, graduates to spread this message would obviously go a long way. Let us move from education, health, and nutrition, uh, uh, nutrition uh, and, uh, and gender to health. And health is perhaps the most vital ingredient uh, which impacts the well-being of a household. Unfortunately, successive, successive governments have failed to accord public health the required priority. And the COVID pandemic actually had reminded us on the poor state of our public health system and, and hospital infrastructure. However, the budget does not appear to have given any indication that the government accords priority to strengthening of the public health system. And the most cost-effective way of improving health outcomes in the short term is to allocate and strengthen the primary health care system, strengthen preventive and promotive care. In fact, the limited uh, allocations that are uh, shown in the budget are, again, does not, do not appear to be in the area of primary health. I could see, for instance, only one allocation uh, of 70 crores for community hospitals and another 25 crores, as I mentioned, for anemia control. Bulk of it is not towards primary care. 
The last, of course, is the Guru Shakti scheme, or 200 units of electricity. And voices have already been raised that this 200 units is actually much less than the consumption of even of poor households. And if the tariff of the plus 200 has increased, then really the impact on the household is going to be very minimal. But more than that, there are some concerns. And like we said, school education is in a state of crisis. The energy sector is in a state of crisis. The budget itself has highlighted that the outstanding loan of electricity com companies has risen to an astronomical figure of over 90,000 crores. The cumulative loss of companies has risen to over 17,000 crores. And in addition, there is media information that about 20,000 crores is owed to contractors. In this situation, it is feared that if electric, uh, electricity companies are not reimbursed and compensated the provision of free electricity on time, the financial situation of these companies could become even much worse, and they could even face a financial collapse. In the larger context, it has become very clear that despite this separation of power and distribution, the power reforms have not really brought financial health to the electricity companies, and there is therefore a need to take a hard look at the energy sector to restore the financial health of these com companies. The last area that I plan to look at is urban settlements. And I mention this because there is enough evidence that over 70% of the income growth will take place in towns and cities. Many gram panchayats have actually become urban settlements and have acquired urban characteristics. Large scale migration will take place and we can live in denial, they will take place into towns and cities. And it will therefore put pressure not only in Bangalore, but also in other cities and uh, towns. Uh, there is therefore an uh, urgent need to improve civic services, not only in Bangalore, but in all urban settlements. And each of us sitting here in Bangalore uh, would be happy about the vision statement for upgrading Bangalore to a world-class city. I am reminded of the time when SM Krishna was a, a CM, and he had mentioned that he would, his wish was to make Bangalore another Singapore. Well, this time around, the vision has been backed by a reasonably large allocation within the constraints of 45,000 crores for Bangalore. So this should, of course, please us all. And the, the plan seems to be fairly comprehensive, focus on traffic, environment, waste management, usage of public spaces, public and animal health, uh, people-friendly e-governance, water security, and flood management. However, the one area which they've talked about but doesn't seem to have been addressed in the budget is road congestion. And I go back to my old hypothesis that metros are not the answer in terms of budget priorities for reducing road consumption. I do not wish to argue that roads and flyovers are not required and metro systems do not deserve attention, but we are talking of priorities. And we must ask whether government should continue to yield to the pressure of motor vehicle owners like us to keep on building flyovers and roads. If you were to actually look at it dispassionately, the most effective way of getting people or reducing congestion is to get people to walk. In any case, most poor households walk to work. They don't even use a bus. And with Bangalore having the climate it has, it should be possible to get people to walk if they were good quality and well-lit pedestrian paths. Estimates suggest that over 30% of us are obese, myself included, and walking is not only going to reduce road congestion, but it also improve the health of its population. But it is unfortunate that I could not find the budget a special focus on pedestrian paths and strengthening bus transport. And a beginning can be made, even if you're sold on metro systems, that at least one and a half kilometers from every metro station, you upgrade walking paths so that people don't have to uh, find difficulty in accessing the metro. And this money that is spent could easily be more than compensated because the ridership of the metro systems will increase dramatically. And as I mentioned and he did, while allocations to Bangalore are welcome, it could be argued that there appears to have been a lopsided attention to one city. 
it does contribute 30%, Bangalore district does contribute 30% of the state's income. But isn't there a need to also focus on other cities which have potential? As we mentioned, Mangalore, Mysore, Belgaum, Gulbarga, Shimoga, Tum Tumkur. And there is a huge potential of increasing the employment potential of these cities and focusing on some of the uh, cities in the backward regions of Karnataka would also ease the pressure on Bangalore. And therefore, in identifying these, what we call, I call potential manufacturing clusters, give priority to manufacturing clusters in the backward regions of the state. I'm not saying that you set up manufacturing clusters in remote places, which is what, when I was in the industries department, we did. We set up industrial sheds in God-forsaken places and nobody went there. So identify places where there's already a stimulus and potential and build, build on that. We've also spoken of the variance in human, and, uh, in, uh, human development in, uh, indicators and income. And we must note that the budget has responded. It is allocated 3,000 crores uh, for aspirational taluks, which have been identified based on poor performance on uh, human development indicators. This is supposed to be used for uh, education, health, and nutrition improvement. And this is an excellent initiative. Uh, and I specifically mention because this does show that the government at some level is committed to inclusive development. I end with one small point, and that is with state finances under stress, isn't it also time for the government to look at improving the quality of life by shoring up revenues from non-state resources? And here I talk about the potential to review the revenue potential of urban local bodies and gram panchayats. The devolution of funds to urban local bodies and panchayats is estimated in the budget about 70,000 crores. And I think Mr. Sudhakar Rao, I think, chairs that commission on maybe some more will, will go into those states. But the fiscal space to give much more, as we said, is going to be limited. Perhaps what has happened over the years, at least in gram panchayats, that they have got so used to grants that I think a study shows that most gram panchayats, out of the total revenues, less than 5% is raised through its own resources. So 95% of revenues that come to gram panchayat come through government grants. Now, this is an unfortunate state of affairs. And uh, historically, even where they raise revenue, property and water taxes alone of municipalities and panchayats have been seen as sources of revenue. One area where uh, has been neglected and in the context of improving civic services becomes relevant is user services for things like waste management, garbage, sewage treatment. There is no reason why citizens should not be asked to bear the cost of the collection, transportation, and disposal of waste, both liquid and uh, solid waste. And citizens of Bangalore and elsewhere cannot be complaining of dirt and garbage in our cities and lack of sewage collection, but not be willing to pay for these services. I, I'll just give you, when I was a chairman, we introduced something called a sewerage cess for the first time. It was overturned in 48 hours by the collective wisdom of the elected legislatures. And despite knowing that sewage investments are actually require much higher investments than laying a water supply line. Globally in Europe, sewage cess is higher than the water cess because it costs more, especially treatment and disposal. So basically the panchayats have had a very poor record of revenue collection and this appear to be somewhat reconciled to the grants that they received. Uh, so therefore, it is incorrect for gram panchayats to assume that they have inelastic or static sources of revenue. So I think a priority need to be given by the government in getting panchayats to be fixed, heavy targets on shoring up their own revenues, maybe through an incentive structure that if you raise by 10%, I will give you a corresponding amount. I, I don't know, those modalities will try to be worked out. And similarly for the urban local bodies. And I'm sure if you engage with these local bodies in a a spirit of give and take, a lot of good solutions would emerge. In conclusion, let me say that 
the, the, the budget at one level has demonstrated the ability to fulfill its commitment to the five guarantees. However, there, there are several areas for improvement, even within these fiscal challenges, to prioritize interventions to improve the quality of life, enhance livelihoods, and address the wide, wide uh, variances across the state. The government has had very little time uh, before it could present the, the budget. So I think the benefit of doubt needs to be given to Atik and his team and to the chief minister. These are early days of the government. But let us hope that the government will undertake a very dispassionate and objective analysis in each sector and prepare a holistic, integrated development plan to give a further boost to growth as well as address the glaring gaps that exist. If this exercise is done properly, I am confident that Karnataka has the potential to become a model for governance and development in the country. The focus must remain, of course, on poor households, who unfortunately do not carry much voice. And we, as members of the civil society, also carry the heavy responsibility to engage with the government and ensure that the government adopts what should become a people-centered development agenda. Thank you, sir. Friends, uh, we had a very fine presentation by Sanjay uh, bringing uh, the insights of his book into the specific context of this year's Karnataka budget. So we will spend the next 10, 15, 20 minutes on possible questions to which he'll respond. Then I'll take five, 10 minutes to sum up. Quick question. Uh, I'm Dr. Sangeeta Pushotman uh, from Best Practices Foundation, and uh, I wanted to understand um, your views on cash transfers because my memory from you know previous studies is that Brazil started this conditional cash transfers to boost its economy, and then Philippines tried it. Uh, and found tremendous success in terms of increase in purchasing power in the hands of women. Uh, and as a result, the, the economy grew, right? So that was the purpose of that. But it was conditional, conditional on you know, vaccinations, enrollment of girl children in schools, and so on. Is it too late to make it conditional as a way to increase awareness? That's the first question. The second question is that there has been you know, in the C20 dialogues where we've been part of a lot of discussions, uh, there has been a whole move that we're seeing globally uh, to uh, work on climate change, yeah? And many of us are really struggling, we're working on the ground, but we don't know how and where to deal with climate change, and we're a little lost, right? And so we're really hoping that the government would take some initiative because uh, that's where a lot of the funds are going, and that's where the future is heading. And we actually need schemes on climate change um, to move forward. Linking to that also, you know, funds for the youth to be engaged in climate change. So a whole series of areas which require attention, which um, we're not quite seeing in, you know, government budgets. Yeah? And then, despite uh, the COVID-19 pandemic for three years, what may be the reason for a low priority for uh, health sector? Is the lesson, what is the lesson learned? Our health sector continues to be uh, ignored and not a 
popular uh, place for uh, investment or is because the government has changed they did not bear the brunt a new political party has come to power is it the reason i just want an answer yeah thank you good evening my name is pooja mini i actually have two questions so if you look at the revenue expenditure of karnataka uh, in the last 10 years from 2012 onwards except for the last two years there's actually been a cash surplus and given that background with a whole lot of new schemes getting introduced you know uh, would like your inputs or comments about that you know how do we look at these new schemes and new allocations against the context of cash surplus for continuous 8 years and uh, secondly you talked about uh, education and how we can improve it uh, with respect to bringing transparency and accountability i thought karnataka already had that you know with the teacher transfer act and you started that like you know you when when you were the education secretary you initiated the uh, which is now got converted into a teacher transfer act and now it's into recruitment the whole counseling process it's gone accepted by other departments as well so what else can karnataka do if you're already doing all of that and yet there is lack of uh, accountability and transparency that you feel it's there thank you so firstly uh, this shrinivas here i used to work in the cbps earlier uh, firstly congratulations on a very fine presentation i think it's one of the best budget lectures i have heard personally uh, thank you for a, a very insightful presentation so i have two observations questions uh, partly is one is that you know uh, uh, the difference between a freebie and a, a welfare measure i would apply the criteria you know of two criteria one is that you know it should be need based second it should be merit based you know it should be need based and second it should be merit based and thirdly i think one concern would also be um, uh, what is the impact of this freebies on environment or sustainability so like for instance if you take uh, the free power how much because free power of 200 units is practically available to anybody uh, without any means test without any merit uh, so a would that encourage people to use power indiscriminately like i don't switch off my fan i don't switch off my lights you know because it's free second i mean that also has a implication for environment because i'm using fossil fuels the energy is not uh, something which is which should be conserved uh, so again you know like uh, the uh, the free transport for women could have been need based you know it could have instead of being free for all travel any number of times to anywhere uh, it could have been safe a pass to go to work or to go to an educational institution or to or maybe once or twice a, a month to a certain place it could have been moderated rather than make it uh, completely uh, open ended uh, that's one part of it i would like your comments on that and the second is i mean fortunately uh, i think congress uh, in karnataka has sidestepped the revert sell to op open you know like uh, your uh, old pension scheme which i think the congress government elsewhere like in uh, himachal rajasthan chatisgarh have uh, gone that path but that i think is a uh, uh, wonderful thing that they haven't done it here because i think uh, the new pension pension scheme was a very hard won bipartisan reform because it made no sense to uh, pay the pensions of course i am a beneficiary of the whole pension scheme but then uh, uh, there's no sense in uh, using tax revenues to pay pen government pensions but what i would like to understand from you is what is the political economy behind this because all said and done government servants in any state are not a very large number maybe they number to a few lakhs with their families maybe multiplied by 2 3 3 they don't amount to much and they anyway are spread all over the state they are not in one constituency and then at the end of the day they all vote 
either by their caste, religion, or by ideology. So what is the political economy that is driving uh, this move by the governments to switch to World Pension Scheme? Thank you. Namaskara, I am E. Basuraju, Karnataka Jnana Vijnana Samiti. I am very happy to be here. The first thing is that the government is not going to be able to do this. The government is not going to be able to do this for the first two years. The government is not going to be able to do this for the first two years. Istella, nan budget pratiyana nodi la, adre Sanjay Kolo ora presentation nana gamus taga. I gramina pradesh tinda nagarikke walase baru anta, ondo dudda signya bertai de, haldi gadu, antara waisa jauri ro ur gadak tai de, manegal bidok tai de. Nan cikka ondi taga istu jaga yara dro kotre, naa wadna warikke release ke tagun kelsa marti dbi. Ika jamin kotor mador ila athar agi de, untuk kade raitro atmahatya nu nadi tida inon untuk kade, wewasa anu do aston do attract bagi la, beri beri karne ke kasle agta ide, matu sariyad samiya ke raitri ke bela sikta illa, ya waglo exact bitenta yer utte matte takshana bidogutte, cost of production nu jasti agta ide, ha gagi, i agriculture kshetra vanna, nama budget nali hengga address madla agi de, matu General na, wewasai dalih, teruk speku, adon tu lalai attractive lagi ron tak khasiatra anta mardhe wodre. I migration no matto unemployment ana tu dudda pidga lagi nama na kardte matte Bangalore adon na withstand mardkarak thadya ne illa no do, nanu ande praya, i bagye tama pratikriya. Thank you sir. Hello everyone, Namaskar sir. Sir, I am the head of KS Vengtation. I worked in Raichur Thermal Power Station for 36 and a half years. Now, in the case of this teaching, we are more concentrated on environment. Fuzzy fuel, use generate, and it is very dangerous. In this case, in total, overall India, 70 to 80 percent fuzzy fuel जेनरेट मारी करता है ये पावर जेनरेशन पर्टिकुलरली इन कर्नाटका 240 मिलियन यूनिट्स पर डे बेको नमगे इधर अल 110 मिलियन यूनिट्स 110 टू 120 मिलियन यूनिट्स के केपीसीएल अंदर है गवर्नमेंट सेक्टर इन द बर्ताय रिमेइंग पार्ट वी आर बाइंग फ्रॉम द आउटसाइड एट द रेट ऑफ फ्लोटिंग इट इज अराउंड Already KPCL is under loss. Nearly 24,000 crores pending is there. From last 30 years. Ega itara scheme madi drinda. Ega power sector nali early nadre 28 to 34 percent efficiency line runna gatte. Ali one one the milligram ko nau ke leka aktivi. Adu yena gatte nadre interest irate. Ek nadre fuzzy fuel khadme madi beko usage khadme madi beko. Anta. ई तरह ई दागा ई वन से मारे लेने लगते फ्री पावर कोटा ये स्टार जेनरेट मारो हिंगाद्रो मारो आ आदि क्या अन्ना अकाउंटेब अकाउंटेबिलिटी इरोज़ नहीं ला सीरियस नेस्वी रहा अवरो ब्रेड ही दिया ई का फ्री पावर 200 यूनिट्स अंदर है अतु साधारण नमली 80 परसेंट ऑफ़ द पीपल दे आर यूजिंग टू विथिन द 200 इधर ले मने ने ले सोलर यूज़ मारो रे जरे सोलर पावर ही इधर चल यू रेल्लर और डी मार्लेज़ आप इधर यारो पावर ना इन्वेस्टमेंट भी है हाँ को दिला वन दो ये फाइव इयर्स बैक हो प्रतियोगिता में ने लो सोलर पावर हाँ किधर है निम्न इंसेंटिव कोटा इधरो इन नाउ इट इस टोटली स्टॉपल इधर इन द आर्थिकता this is a very serious thing. India is committed to green energy. If you cut all the fuel, 
ಎನ್ವಿರಾನ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಪೊಲ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಜಾಸ್ತಿ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಇದ್ರ ಜನ್ರೇಷನ್ನೇ ಮಾಡಬಾರ್ದು ಅಂತ ಇದೆ ಈಗಾಗಲೇ ನಾವು ಫ್ರಾನ್ಸ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಇದಕ್ಕೆ ಬ ಅಗ್ರಿಮೆಂಟ್ ಸೈನ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದೀವಿ ಟೂ ತೌಸಂಡ್ ಫೈವ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ಈ ಆ ಏಮ್ ಇಟ್ಕೊಂಡು ನಾವು ರೂಲ್ಸ್ ಮಾಡಬೇಕೆ ವಿನಃ ಅದು ಬಿಟ್ಟುಬಿಟ್ಟು ಇದು ಈ ಥರ ಮಾಡಿದರೆ ತುಂಬ ಹೊಡೆತ ಕೊಡುತ್ತೆ ಅಂದರೆ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಟೋಟಲಿ ಡಿಪೆಂಡಿಂಗ್ ಅಪಾನ್ ಹೈಡ್ರೋ ಪವರ್ ಇದರಿಂದ ಏನು ಅರ್ಥ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಅಂದರೆ ಕ್ಲಾರಿಟಿ ಸಿಗ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ಜನರಿಗೆ ಆಮೇಲೆ ಯಾವುದೇ ಫ್ರೀ ಅಂದರೆ ಅದಕ್ಕೆ ಮೆಜರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಇರೋದಿಲ್ಲ ಹೆಂಗೆ ಬೇಕೋ ಹಂಗೆ ಯೂಸ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಾರೆ ಅವ್ರು ಹೇಳಿದರು ಕ್ಲೀನಾಗಿ ಒಂದು ಸೀರಿಯಸ್ನ ಇರಬೇಕು ಸೀರಿಯಸ್ನೆಸ್ ಬರಬೇಕು ಅಂದರೆ ಮೆಜರ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಇರಲೇಬೇಕು ಅಂದರೆ ಮಾತ್ರ ಇದು ತೊಗೊಳ್ಳಿಕ್ಕೆ ಸಾಧ್ಯ ಆಮೇಲೆ ಎಫಿಷಿಯನ್ಸಿ ಇನ್ಕ್ರೀಸ್ ಮಾಡೋ ಗೋಲ್ ಇರಬೇಕು ಅವೆಲ್ಲ ಕಟ್ಟಾಗಿ ಕಟ್ಟಾಗ್ಬಿಡ್ತಲ್ಲ ಈಗ ಏನೇ ಏಮೇ ಇಲ್ಲ ಈಗ ಎಷ್ಟಾರು ಯೂಸ್ ಮಾಡು ಹೆಂಗಾರು ಹೋಗು ಹೆಂಗಾರು ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಅವರು ಅವರ ಬಸ್ಸು ಫ್ರೀ ಕೊಟ್ಟಂಗೆ ಆಗಿದೆ ಇದು ಒನ್ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡಲ್ಲಿ ಇದು ಇದು ತುಂಬ ಯೋಚನೆ ಮಾಡ ಮಾಡೋ ಅಂಥ ಇದು ಭಾಳ ಗಂಭೀರವಾಗಿ ಯೋಚನೆ ಮಾಡಬೇಕು ಪವರ್ ಸೆಕ್ಟರ್ನಲ್ಲಿ ನಾವು ಕೋಲ್ ಬೈ ಮಾಡಬೇಕಾದ್ರೆ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಡೆಪಾಸಿಟ್ ಇಟ್ಟು ಕೋಲ್ ತೊಗೋಬೇಕು ಆಮೇಲೆ ಪವರ್ ಜನ್ರೇಷನ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಕೊಡಬೇಕು ಈ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸಾಕ್ಷನಲ್ಲೇ ಟ್ವೆ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಟು ತರ್ಟಿ ಪರ್ಸೆಂಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಎನರ್ಜಿ ಲಾಸ್ ಆಗುತ್ತೆ ಇದೆಲ್ಲ ಇಟ್ಕೊಂಡು ಇದು ಹಾಂ ಓಕೆ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಇದ್ರ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಥಿಂಕ್ ಮಾಡಿ ಸ್ವಲ್ಪ ಎಲ್ಲ ನನ್ನ ಹೆಸರು ಪ್ರಭಾ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ಇಲ್ಲಿ ಒಂದು ಅಂಡರ್ ಪಾಸ್ ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅಂಡರ್ ಪಾಸ್ ಮಾಡಿದಾಗ ಬಸವನಗುಡಿ ಪ್ರದೇಶದ ಜನ ಎಲ್ಲರೂ ವಿರೋಧ ಮಾಡಿದರು ಸುಮ್ಮನೆ ದುಡ್ಡು ಆಗ್ತಿದ್ದೀರಿ ಇದರಿಂದ ನಮಗೆ ಏನೂ ಪ್ರಯೋಜನ ಇಲ್ಲ ಇದನ್ನು ಮಾಡಬೇಡಿ ಅಂತ ಆದರೂ ಸಮೇತ ಹಠಕ್ ಬಿದ್ದು ಅದನ್ನು ಮಾಡಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಅದು ಇಲ್ಲದೇ ಇದ್ದಾಗ ಏನು ಪರಿಸ್ಥಿತಿ ಇತ್ತು ಟ್ರಾಫಿಕ್ದು ಈಗಲೂ ಅದೇ ಭಾಳ ಚೇಂಜ್ ಏನೂ ಆಗಲಿಲ್ಲ ನಾನು ಗಮನಿಸಿದ್ದೀನಿ ಐ ಎ ಎಸ್ ಸಿ ಐ ಬಸ್ ಸ್ಟಾಪ್ ಹತ್ರ ಒಂದು ಎರಡು ಮೂರು ಶೆಲ್ಟರ್ಗಳನ್ನು ಕಟ್ಟಿದರು ಒಂದೇ ಒಂದು ತಿಂಗಳೂ ಸಮೇತ ಉಪಯೋಗ ಮಾಡಲಿಲ್ಲ ಅದನ್ನು ಕ್ಲೋಸ್ ಮಾಡಿರಿ ಅಲ್ಲೊಂದು ಮಾಡಿದ್ರು ಅಲ್ಲೊಂದು ಅಂಡರ್ ಪಾಸ್ ಮಾಡಿದರು ಮತ್ತು ಹೆಬ್ಬಾಳದ ಹತ್ರ ಒಂದು ಸ್ಟೀಲ್ ಬ್ರಿಡ್ಜ್ ಮಾಡ್ತೀವಿ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿದರು ಜನ ತುಂಬ ಅಪೋಸ್ ಮಾಡಿದರು ಆದರೂ ಅದನ್ನು ಕಟ್ಟಿದರು ನಾನು ಇದನ್ನು ಉದಾಹರಣೆಗಳಾಗಿ ಹೇಳ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದೀನಿ ಈ ಥರದ್ದು ರಾಜ್ಯ ತುಂಬ ನಡೀತಾ ಇದ್ದಾವೆ ಮತ್ತು ನಮ್ಮ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕ್ ಸೆಕ್ಟರ್ಗಳೆಲ್ಲ ಲಾಭದಲ್ಲಿರುವಂಥ ಪಬ್ಲಿಕ್ ಸೆಕ್ಟರ್ಗಳೆಲ್ಲನೂ ಕೂಡ ಅದು ಬೆಲೆಗಿಂತ ಕಡಿಮೆ ಬೆಲೆಗೆ ಅದನ್ನು ಅಪಮೌಲ್ಯ ಮಾಡಿ ಅದರದ್ದು ಮೌಲ್ಯ ಏನಿರ್ತದೆ ಅದಕ್ಕಿಂತ ಕಡಿಮೆ ಮಾಡಿ ಖಾಸಗಿ ಅವರಿಗೆಲ್ಲ ಹ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಓವರ್ ಮಾಡ್ತಿದ್ದಾರೆ ಇಷ್ಟೆಲ್ಲ ಆಗುವಾಗ ಅಲ್ಲೆಲ್ಲ ಸಾರ್ವಜನಿಕರ ದುಡ್ಡು ಪೋಲಾಗ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಅದು ವೇಸ್ಟ್ ಆಗ್ತಾ ಇದೆ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ಅನ್ನಿಸ್ತಾ ಇಲ್ಲ ನಮಗೆ ಸಾರ್ವಜನಿಕರಿಗೆ ಉಪಯೋಗ ಆಗುವಂಥ ನಾಲ್ಕಾರು ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಗಳನ್ನು ಜನಕೇಂದ್ರಿತವಾದಂಥ ನಾಲ್ಕಾರು ಕಾರ್ಯಕ್ರಮಗಳನ್ನು ಸರ್ಕಾರ ಜಾರಿ ಮಾಡಿದ ಕೂಡಲೇ ಅದನ್ನು ಫ್ರೀ ಬೀಸ್ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ಕರೆಯುವಂಥದ್ದು ಯಾಕೆ ಇಲ್ಲೊಂದು ದುಡ್ಡು ಹೋಗಿದೆ ಫ್ರೀಯಾಗಿ ಸುಮಾರು ದುಡ್ಡು ಈ ಥರದ್ದೆಲ್ಲ ಸರ್ಕಾರದ್ದು ಬೇಕಾದಷ್ಟು ಪೋಲಾಗಿ ಹೋಗಿದೆ ಬೆಂಗಳೂರಿನಲ್ಲಿ ಬಿ ಎಮ್ ಟಿ ಸಿ ಸುಮಾರು ಬಸ್ಗಳನ್ನು ಓಲ್ವೋ ಬಸ್ಗಳನ್ನು ಖರೀದಿ ಮಾಡಿದರು ಆ ಬಸ್ಗಳನ್ನು ಕೆಲವೇ ದಿನಗಳಲ್ಲಿ ಸ್ಕ್ರ್ಯಾಪ್ಗೆ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ಹಾಕಿದರು ಅದು ಒನ್ ಟನ್ನು ಕಬ್ಬಣ ತೊಗೊಳ್ತಾರಲ್ಲ ತೂಕ ಹಾಕ್ಕೊಂಡು ಗುಜರಿ ಲೆಕ್ಕದಲ್ಲಿ ಆ ಲೆಕ್ಕದಲ್ಲಿ ಬಸ್ ಖರೀದಿ ಮಾಡಿ ಬಿಸಾಕಿದರು ಆ ಕಡೆಗೆ ಕೋಟ್ಯಾಂತರ ರೂಪಾಯಿ ಈ ರೀತಿಯಲ್ಲಿ ನಷ್ಟ ಆಗಿದೆ ಸರ್ಕಾರದ್ದು ಇದೆಲ್ಲನೂ ಕೂಡ ಹಾಳಾಗ್ತಿದೆ ಅಂತ ಹೇಳಿ ಯೋಚನೆ ಮಾಡಲಾರ್ದಂಥ ಜನ ಫ್ರೀಬಿಗಳ ಬಗ್ಗೆ ಯಾಕೆ ಅಷ್ಟೊಂದು ಅಸಹನೆಯನ್ನು ವ್ಯಕ್ತಪಡಿಸ್ತಾ ಇದ್ದಾರೆ ಇದು ಏನು ಇದು ಥಾಟ್ 
one that conditional cash transfers actually are inimical to the interests of poor households. Uh, I'll give you an example. You could take the example of vaccination. Uh, and, and I mentioned in the book that poor households do not always behave rationally. They have other commitments and survival issues. So just because a family has not sent the girl for vaccination, should she be deprived of that benefit? So these are the kind of ideological questions that will arise. So it's not a straight black and white kind of answer. On climate change, certainly, every government, including the central government, needs to give a thrust to climate uh, environment. Of course, pollution levels and reducing con congestion would be uh, uh, one area. One area which I think uh, does need to look at, Karnataka needs to look at, is what impact it will have on cropping patterns and crops. Uh, luckily, in Karnataka, paddy is not going to be affected, uh, largely because of warming. But the winter crops in elsewhere of the country will be badly affected. So I think that's something which the government of India need, needs to begin thinking about. The health sector, my, my response is that this was the perception of the government that these are areas which, and I think I'm responding to what Madhu Siddhan also said, when it goes to the people, it identifies what it feels are people's concerns. And perhaps wrongly, it did not feel that health was a priority. Now, which is not true of all con Congress governments. In Rajasthan, for instance, a universal health coverage and health for all has become a selling point of the government. So I think the challenge for any government is to how to sell good policies to the electorate. And if you cannot sell good policies to the electorate, then you'll end up have having some schemes which are sound, but also some other schemes which are not so sound. And you talked about electricity, I completely share. That perhaps may not have been the best way of going about uh, elect uh, the energy policy of the state. The transparency in education you mentioned. I wasn't talking of teachers alone. Uh, the posting and transfers of education officers is still very politicized and develops vested interests. So when the, so the supervisory systems are not very clear, clean, you cannot expect a good quality of educational governance and management. The pension scheme, Mr. Srinivas, absolutely right, that again, it's politically, how do you sell? If you do not want to go back to the old pension scheme, how do you sell something else which is financially sustainable to the people? when you go to the masses. I think that is what Mudin Madhusudan said, that the government is going to be judged at the end of five years, not only on its economic performance, whether it can sell its performance for the next, next time round. So it's, it's a little difficult. And the political economy of things, I think civil society also has to be a little more innovative and imaginative in identifying schemes which are politically saleable. Underpass and flyovers, there was a study in Latin America that every flyover actually only postpones the congestion <laughs> or, or shifts it geographically. And the same thing would be true of underpasses. I completely share your view and, and I think uh, the pressure is from motor vehicle owners. A transport policy should be about moving people and not moving vehicles. And once we understand that the whole object of transport and public transport is to move people and not vehicles, we'll shift away from focusing on roads and flyovers and underpasses to where people can walk and mo move from one place to the other. I've not covered all. I thought it would be a little awkward to hold this and speak, so I'll take a few minutes. I'll react both to what I heard uh, Sanjay expound so articulately and passionately, and uh, the questions and some of the feelings behind uh, the questions that the audience uh, uh, raised. I won't follow a very sequential thing in the same order, but uh, it's all here, so if it is a little random, please excuse me for that. See, first of all, when you 
want to evaluate uh, budget in some kind of uh, intellectual framework provided by uh, your study of an alternate development agenda. Of course, you're very right in saying that, uh, you know, the government has it, the road running and it's too early and, but within all the constraint, what are the good things and so on, it's a very, very fair assessment. But let's go a little beyond this. Now, sustainability is not just 52,000 crores or 60,000 crores being funded without increasing your budget deficit or borrowings and uh, compromising on your ability to take up new projects and new schemes and so on. Let us say that the 60,000 crores or 52,000 crores in this budget is, is, is spent. Let's also assume for a moment that uh, it reaches all the beneficiaries and so on. Now the question that interests me or intrigues me is, would a good part of this 52,000 crores not flow back into the economy in some kind of a virtuous cycle? You see, all of us, I heard some of you saying that, uh, you know, if you have uh, Gra Lakshmi and this free electricity, it'll be wasted. Now, is it the case or is it anybody's argument that only household consumers, particularly the wives, waste power? Is it not also true that industry wastes power? So why, why are we taking a very dim view of how, I mean, his thing was that we must, it's pro people, pro poor people and so on. Why should we a priori say that these are people who are going to you know, take a number of bus rides and go, fine, let, let housewives go. What will they go for? They'll go for shopping, right? Wouldn't that shopping not kickstart some industry somewhere? Will not, see, as it is, you know, when your national statistics are not really, we keep mourning the fact that, you know, consumption expenditure is down and so on. If consumption expenditure goes up, is that not a good thing? Now, this is a tricky question. Of course, simplistically we can say, yeah, it's a good thing and all that. But Sanjay was right in pointing out what kind of a thing. See, that is where the devil is in the detail. He talked of industrial production clusters and so on. But the kind of money that this 52,000 crores is going to put in the hands of 1.3 crore households, this is not something which uh, is going to be catered to by an industry that a foreign direct investor or a captain of the industry is going to set up in country. Now, I was just reading a couple of days ago that one of the unintended uh, collateral damages of the new expressway between Bangalore and Mysore is that the toy industry in Chennapatna has uh, been badly hit. Now, whether this was foreseen or not, I do not know. But still, this is it. Therefore, you know, I mean, one of the challenges uh, for Atik and his team, the entire government, and the political executive is this 52,000 crores, let's not get carried away by what the press and even uh, the judiciary is condemning as freebies. You know? To that extent, I think the battle is already won. I think the Karnataka budget and the poll promises have given this uh, level of respectability, which I think it badly needed. But we have to go beyond that. What kind of industry will capture this purchasing power generated by this 52,000 crores? Clearly, this is not going to be the things which are going to be started by uh, unicorns and startups and so on. So we'll have to. Therefore, coming back to uh, thing, what kind of industrialization policy would the new Karnataka government initiate which is not to say that you junk whatever you have been pursuing, but parallelly, in addition, as a complementary initiative, can you do something? I mean, I don't know if uh, the industry minister covers uh, the small industries also, or there is a cabinet minister for small and MSME sector and so on. So, but I'm sure that in six months' time, Mr. Sidramaya and D.K. Shokumar and the others will 
uh, get ready for their global investors summit and so on. What is the kind of thing that you're going to project at the global? There again, if you say that Bangalore has got the greatest climate and this, that network, I mean, he talked of production clusters. The point is that uh, there is a natural proclivity for everybody to come to Bangalore. But which state government would consciously say, would this one do? Say that, sorry, Bangalore is closed for further investment. We want investment. I mean, everybody has talked of uh, Mysore. Even when I was Deputy Commissioner of Mysore, uh, in 1980-81, we, we were the one of the first districts to have a district industry center to, to attract things and all. But then everybody said, oh, sir, Mysore University, Tono, it's a cultural capital, Il industries, Baroda, Illa. This is the kind of thing that uh, was. But things have changed a lot. Uh, there was a first wave of industrialization and so on, which uh, this thing, but now, you know, again, the IT companies have moved in their uh, second campuses and all that. So Mysore was now an industrial town. So in a smaller way is Hubli Darwar and so on. But this is, uh, you know, worth uh, spending time and a uh, lot of thought uh, needs to be given to this. Which takes me to another issue. Uh, I mean, this links up with urbanization and so on. Now, both in this uh, presentation at uh, the BIC, which I watched on YouTube uh, because I was preparing for today, uh, I couldn't uh, be there that day. Uh, you know, you, you, you make the point that uh, there's too much distress in agriculture and you, you can't offer in situ solutions to people in the rural thing. So uh, increased migration is inevitable. I, I grant you that. But again, you know, migration and mobility should not be thought in terms of only people leaving Gulbarga and Bidar and Raichur and coming away and, you know, Bangalore's population <laughs> going to 20 million and things like that. You see, in international migration also, we talk these days increasingly because migration management is becoming increasingly contentious from a foreign policy and regulatory regime perspective. So the concept that is emerging now and it's blessed by the UN and so on is the concept of circular migration. Now, if you, I'm, I'm sure all of you in your respective residential areas, you'll see many new houses and many old houses being reconstructed. Talk to, see any of those construction workers and so on, chances are they are from Yadgir, Raichur, Koppal, places like that and so on. They're quite happy to work here uh, uh, between Habas, you know, they'll come in summer and all that. Deepali, Davasra, Tamil, Hotoktare, and then they come again, work, and then go back next year and so on. Now, if our uh, 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 you know, the, the identity ecosystem uh, based on other, based on whatever. Uh, I heard Vandana Sharma, Vandita Sharma saying that there is a Kutumb uh, uh, ecosystem. I don't know what it is, but supposing through a combination of all this, we ensure that any of those workers who come here will have portability of benefits, right? That their Gulbarga ration card will give them rations here. Uh, their health card there will give them access to a PhC or uh, BM, BBMP uh, hospital here in Bangalore. Then, you know, none of them will like to be in Bangalore permanently. They'll come seasonally and go back. Exactly like it happens in internet. So why can't we make this happen? This is something which I think, again, we need to think about. Now, on a similar uh, thing about uh, education, uh, uh, Sanjay's suggestion of using the uh, stipend, you know, the unemployed graduates and uh, diploma holders benefit to, uh, to enroll them as tutors or basic health workers and all is, is again, out of the box uh, thinking. I, I welcome that. The only thing is that in our uh, system with our civil service rules and uh, the constitution and so on. Many of these people, they'll work for two, three years and then give an RG for some jobs regular as Marbidi Sar and all that. So this is a danger. But how do we sort of 
uh, ensure that uh, this doesn't happen. I mean, it's easy to sort of f flag it as an issue, but it's much more difficult uh, to realize that in practice. Uh, take another thing. Uh, Sanjay again said that uh, education, for instance, there's not uh, enough. 11% is good, but again, you know, uh, you see, if, if the education policy old or new and so on, if it keeps talking about the gross enrollment ratio, then, you know, the, some of the grossness associated with that comes to haunt you. See, if everybody sort of uh, graduates, I mean, if everybody enrolls and goes uh, to higher educational institutions, then surely, unless you have simultaneously attacked the quality of education, the quality of teachers, uh, the way lessons are taught, and the content of the curriculum, and so on, then you will you will have a high unemployability definitely. So we'll have to context that and see if there is an imaginative way to combine the schemes in this guarantee, implicit in this guarantees, in innovative ways. I think it it'll all be for the good. All of which I think takes me, and this would probably be my last one or two points. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, good thing is, uh, you know, something well begun is half done, they say. You know? So I think uh, let's be charitable and say that the Karnataka government has begun well. It, it was done in a hurry. Uh, it's not a perfect thing. I don't think even the chief minister or his team or the government as a whole will claim that we have, they, they were under pressure. Everybody said, oh, you will fall f flat on your face. You will not be able to this thing. They have said, no, we, first of all, they issued the order and they have now given it a backing of the full year's budget. So to that extent, it's begun well and so on. But going forward, uh, you know, the work is not only now started. A lot of creative and innovative thing at every level of the bureaucracy. Sanjay talked about you know, even uh, talking to the women folk, you know, Grihalakshmi is all very nice and so on. But what are you going to do with this money? You know, who is going to communicate to them? Who is going to talk to them? Is it going to be left only to the Minister for Women and Child uh, Development because she is the portfolio minister, the whole government is going to do it, or the bureaucracy is going to do it, and so on. Some of these things. So I think uh, down the thing from the chief secretary downwards, district, everywhere. I think there has to be a re-engagement with the poor, with the beneficiary, with the labartis, saying that, look, there is a paradigm shift. We are now willing to trust you, saying that we, we, we sympathize with you, we, we feel your pain, we feel your uh, suffering. Therefore, to some extent, we are trying to alleviate it by all these measures. These are not perfect, they are not complete, but we are going to do it. But in return, our expectation is that, as he was said for Mr. spend this cash transfer on things other than cereals. Spend this uh, extra money that you have to ensure that your girl goes to college, your daughter uh, continues her education. Don't marry her off early at a teenage thing. See, this kind of packaging is, is not just communication. It has to be made to happen. Now, this, uh, I think this is the last suggestion I want to make. And uh, I'm making use of uh, the fact that this is a forum afforded by CBPS. You see, you need a lot of creative uh, work within the government. And I'm sure that uh, caught as you are in your daily uh, routine and so on. This is something which needs uh, uh, parallel working, uh, other than by full-time bureaucrats doing their own thing and so on. So I was just wondering aloud whether, uh, given the importance of this, not just for Karnataka, but for the states, because as he said, this is politically and electorally a very, very promising thing to pursue for the future of the country. I'm not talking here about any particular state or a party or anything like that. Given that, I think it will be a good idea. 
do uh, consult with the chief secretary and everybody else. If there can be, uh, uh, for want of a better word, let me call it a think tank, right? Uh, Mr. S. M. Krishna called it the Bangalore Agenda Task Force and so on. I, I, you call it whatever, but a few people in the government, a few academics, anchored by one institution like the CBPS and so on. Some of the things that we have all talked about and more ideas will come. How to flesh these out? How will we do it? And this will then tell the Women and Child Welfare Department, look, if this is what you want to sort of get your women to respond to, this is what you ought to be doing. This is what you ought to be doing in higher education. This is what you have to be doing in remedial uh, thing. things like that. So if you do that, then I think next time around, not only will you uh, be able to present a budget which is uh, uh, which has less uh, inconsistencies and so on, uh, but more than that, which will begin to see the reverse flow, the virtuous cycle, as I call, of some of the 52,000 crores that you have present in this. You don't have to make any tall claim. You can even say that it will begin to happen only year three or year four. But at least you will have a core group of uh, economists. And uh, the point is well taken. We, we shouldn't have only economists. Get political scientists, sociologists, others also. Let them look at, I mean, some of the uh, people who spoke, the lady here and the gentleman, you see, you see, by calling it freebies and this thing, you are taking a non-empathetic approach. The whole thing needs to be looked at with empathy. Set up a core group which will do that and give you various alternatives and so on. And finally, decision making is with the political class, the chief minister. But the chief minister and his team need the support. I mean, you will provide the support uh, to do the number crunching, you know, the process the budget process is there, but the content of it will come through this thing for your next budget formulation. This is my hope. I hope that uh, uh, in the years to come, uh, Karnataka will continue to uh, uh, set the example for the rest of the country in some of these things. And to that extent, it can be made a, a broad-based participative process with the civil society, academics, the bureaucrats, uh, and the beneficiaries. I think it'll be, uh, I think the country needs a demonstration that this kind of an approach can work. It can be made to work. Sanjay is all right. He's presenting the intellectual case. It's up to Atik and your team and all of us to work with you and make sure that it can also be realized in practice, given uh, all the constraints that we have with the quality of the bureaucracy, political indifference, corruption, name it, name it, environment, everything. Notwithstanding all this, if we can get onto a trajectory where four years from now, the, your point about political evaluation, Mr. Uh, whoever is the finance minister then, I hope it's Mr. Siddharamaya, he can get up and say, Aid Varshtal Ishmadi And because of this, this is the this thing on welfare, this is the impact on poverty, all those seven things that Sanjay talked about, and present a white paper. And then see collection, not come back and say, oh, so the Aid guarantee could do it, in on the Aid sales TV and Theli Madhadre, then I think we would have wasted five years. I want to see that we use the next five years more constructively, more productively, more participatively. Thank you. Why don't you come then? Yeah. <coughs> Mr. Krish Kumar, sir, Sanjay, Sanjay Kul, sir. And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll just take uh, not more than five minutes, I, uh, because we're already quite late. Uh, a few clarifications only I'll provide. 
uh, UNED actually we have provided 250 crores and we anticipate the outflow to be only 250 crores this year because it's going to be rolled out uh, uh, November, December onwards. Because our promise is that after the um, graduation for six months we'll give a period and after six months also they don't find in the job, they will get enrolled. We have, our estimation is about 5.7 lakh graduates will uh, take the benefit and if their monthly outgo starts in January, then for three months only we'll have to provide. So to, for next year we may have to provide more, more. Number two, actually in the budget we have only provided 35,410 crores for guarantees, not 52,000 crores because our estimate is about 52 to 60,000 crores a year. For the remaining part of this year, which is about eight months and nine months for certain guarantees, we would require only 35,410 crores. That much has been provided. And all the pro guarantees have been completely pro uh, uh, provided. So our actually, which means that the challenges will be bigger next year. This year, full budget we have provided. Uh, uh, we have presented a full budget, but we could, uh, we were required to provide only 35,000, which is roughly about 15 to 17,000 less than what we would have to provide next year. So next year, we'll have to look for additional 17,000 uh, to 17 to 18,000 crores. That actually, uh, this year, our rollout experience will tell us as to what would be our actual outgo. Because we anticipate that about 1.3 crore families of Karnataka would get the benefit of Graha Jyoti, Graha Lakshmi, uh, and Anabhagya, all three, all, all three schemes. But once the enrollment is completed and once the outgo, uh, the numbers could be uh, a little lesser also because, uh, so once if, then based on that we can estimate uh, next year better. So that is an, another point I wanted to make. And then capital investment, uh, actually budget to budget, B to B, uh, we, uh, we claim that we have provided six to 7,000 crores, more than the uh, actual uh, capital expenditure of last year. But uh, the B, uh, Sanjay Kohl sir is right that if the B of uh, the budget estimate of February when the previous chief minister presented, he had uh, 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 provided more than 61,000 crores. So there is a shortfall. But actually a little bit of a jugglery is involved in this because last time uh, uh, for Upper Bhadra project 5,300 crores was provided in the previous budget. And uh, this is a national project and government of India is supposed to give and uh, in one year, 5,300 crores getting drawn from Government of India is just not uh, uh, reasonable. So we have provided for that uh, scheme, Upar Bhadra, but we have provided about 2,000 crores. So that there we, we could save a little bit. Jaljivan mission, we had provided more. This time we have reduced it a little bit uh, on the understanding that if the spending ha happens, then we will always provide more in supplementary. So with a little bit of uh, capital expenditure story is always like this. We will uh, sometimes provide more, ultimately we end up spending not so much or we can provide less and uh, uh, later we can provide more. And one last point I want to make is in terms of, uh, because some of the points that uh, Sanjay, Sanjay Kulsar made are actually very well taken and very useful for me because I will start thinking about those as to how to, uh, uh, how to leverage these guarantees and how to make sure that uh, uh, we, we make full use of them, number one. And number two also, as uh, Krishna Kumar sir suggested that we start thinking of the, thinking about the February budget. The next budget is just a few months away. So February budget also, we uh, this time we didn't have much time and I'm glad uh, speakers have acknowledged that. Uh, next year, we'll have to uh, do a little more thinking and therefore uh, these coming months we need to uh, utilize that. Uh, having said that, that uh, one thing about budget I need to clarify is that when we present a budget, we actually include in the budget speech and the documents generally the uh, um, new initiatives. Many of the ongoing initiatives in various departments we do not again mention because it has already been there. So coming to health sector, I don't think health sector has uh, uh, been neglected. Only thing is that many of the initiatives that have been announced this time are the new initiatives that have been announced, but a lot of ongoing pro uh, programs uh, are, are uh, still there. But the p fair, uh, it's a fair point that uh, how much of emphasis is there on strengthening uh, primary health care and secondary health care, number one. Number two, how much of investment is being made on public health is, is something that we need to watch out for. Because public health is, uh, is, is, is a subject which has not received uh, due uh, recognition in Karnataka, unlike perhaps uh, Kerala. 
uh, a few worries are actually on again capital investment because capital investment because going forward next year if i have to again provide uh, uh, additional 17000 crores and uh, uh, how do we really fund the capital investment is one issue and then the ability to take up new projects, uh, new schemes, new initiatives uh, is a problem and a third problem is actually the rising debt levels. Uh, the Because uh, GSDP figures are buoyant, uh, when uh, Mr. Bombay presented his budget, our GSDP was 22.5 lakh crores. In uh, the, By the time we provided, we were given a bonanza that now the GSDP has been revised upwards by Government of India uh, to 25.5 lakh crores. So therefore we had an additional borrowing space. But the entire additional borrowing space we did not use. We have been very conservative. We have increased the uh, debt only uh, by 8,000 crores and uh, keeping our uh, uh, fiscal deficit to 2.6 percent. We could go by another 0.4 percent. Theoretically, we can go up to 3% of GSDP. Our borrowing could have been much more. We have actually limited the borrowings uh, so that, because the, the way in the last 10 years the interest payments uh, have risen is really worrying. In, from a few uh, less than 10,000 crores, we are now paying 35,000 crores interest payments. And interest payments uh, at some point of time uh, should not lead to an unsustainable level. Uh, of course, there is an argument that if you have the ability to repay, you can borrow as long as it's within 3% of GSDP and as long as your total outstanding liabilities are within 25% of GSDP, we are at 22.6. So we are we have some space there. But I would personally feel that we should actually watch out for debt. We should not uh, uh, increase. And therefore, if you want to further expand the, your budget, uh, and also the budget size of Karnataka has really risen dram dramatically in, since 2013. And uh, in fact, from the last year, B of 22-23 uh, to now, we have almost uh, increased the budget size by about 60, 65,000 crores, which is which is quite huge, even after accounting for inflation. So, therefore, uh, the uh, debt sustainability is, uh, uh, is is an issue that we need to watch out for. And one last comment, I think somebody raised the issue as to what happens to many schemes that were announced in the 22-23 budget. So, 22-23 budget was uh, was an uh, interim budget, what an account, that budget doesn't exist. The budget that is presented is now, because uh, even though we require 35,410 crores more, we haven't raised that much of money from uh, borrowing and taxes. From additional taxes, we have risen, uh, we have raised 13,500 crores, and uh, borrowing, we have raised uh, 8,000 crores. That is actually about 21,000 crores. That's all we have raised. So, which means that we have uh, consolidated some of the previous schemes. We have dropped some of the schemes. Uh, we, we found that many schemes that we have dropped were actually the schemes which now get covered under the four guarantees. Because they, they were earlier addressing a subset of the population, now uh, our uh, coverage is uh, uh, largely universal almost. Out of Karnataka has 1.6 crore uh, families and we are likely to cover 1.3 crore families, which is 80%. So 80% coverage is not... Uh, not a small figure. So that way actually the concern that Sanjay Kolsa raised about actual proper identification of beneficiaries, uh, perhaps uh, because we are going up to 80%, the risks of exclusion may not be many. But again, point is well taken that uh, we have to uh, keep on, uh, we have to watch out for uh, inclusion of people uh, who are not, uh, in the sense, it could be, a, there could be frauds, there could be people taking, uh, we have a quite a robust, I believe, uh, IT system. Because within a very short time, when uh, we realized that the, we are not able to get grain under Anabhagya because FCI stopped uh, the open market sale uh, scheme domestic uh, and they said that we will not open it to state governments. But we ha our chief minister was committed to uh, give the money from January. Uh, in 10 days time, we were able to deliver uh, cash transfer and cash transfer has already begun and 3-4 districts already is gone. By end of this month, cash transfer for all the 1.3 crore families will go. Which means that we have 1.28 crore uh, ration cards out of which uh, more than a crore ration cards have uh, uh, other seeded bank accounts. For the rest, we will uh, take up a drive and get the bank, uh, bank accounts. So those bank accounts are there and the money of Gruhalakshmi will go to more or less the same accounts. 
uh, we have to do some uh, lot of number uh, crunching and analytics to see if the money is not uh, go going away or somebody else is taking a fraud. Because the, in the past, in PM Kisan, some frauds have been detected. Uh, it is possible to use, particularly yesterday's decision to uh, give Gruha Lakshmi to non-Adhar seeded bank accounts also. In that case, we have to do a little bit of extra vigilance, but that's a, a, a point uh, uh, fairly well. Uh, it's a fair point. So I, th I thought I'll just uh, uh, mention these uh, few clarificatory points. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, I'm uh, Jyotsna, and on behalf of uh, myself and CPPS and also the Institute of World Culture. I will start by thanking Mr. Sanjay Kaul for agreeing to come. He lives in Delhi and uh, took the trouble of coming. And uh, uh, two reasons it's important. I mean, he uh, his engagements are not only with Karnataka, but it's obvious that he has, uh, you know, Karnataka has a special place. He has worked for many years. And uh, therefore, so thank you uh, uh, for coming and thank you for actually making the discussion so uh, interesting and uh, deep and uh, also thanks to uh, mr krishna kumar to you know uh, agree to chair and add to that discussion and uh, before closing i would also like to add a few points because you know this whole thing we have as as an institution we have been engaged with and also as an individual i have been deeply engaged with and i would say that one of the biggest thing that uh, this budget has done and uh, uh, you know mm, uh, so uh, atik perhaps can take uh, the rest, you know uh, uh, can feel very good about it is that it also has changed the nature of discourse i think that is critical for especially for people like us, you know, who, who work in, you know, as economists, we work in development and we work on many of these issues, uh, be it gender, be it uh, um, poverty, inequality. For us, it's, it's a very, very critical shift because uh, it's almost like, you know, you, you, uh, you are out on the margin and now you have come to the center. And it's not only Karnataka, it, it is influencing national debate, it is influencing uh, uh, international debate, and especially because internationally this was happening, but somehow it was not being reflected in our country, and therefore I think that that's very, very significant. And Rajasthan uh, example is also uh, very, very critical because Rajasthan uh, has gone ahead with uh, many reforms and uh, and and Therefore, the political economy becomes important. The politics becomes important in determining economics. And, and one is not talking of all this at the cost of growth, but also pointing out that these are as important as growth. So I think that that's a very, very critical thing that has happened. And uh, briefly, a few other points, because again, these are critical from our perspective. Uh, and that's something like you did mention about the free bus pass that uh, uh, Srinivas raised, and also Sangeeta has left, but she raised that issue of conditional. I think it's also important to realize uh, that sense of responsibility is not only, you know, lies with non-poor. Poor is also responsible. And uh, even, say, for example, uh, if, if, you, if you look at across the world, when you have access to anything that entitlement, uh, also I think the language. I mean, I also think the guarantee brings a different discourse, different language. Uh, you know, it, it talks of guarantee, uh, takes you to write rather than just to a uh, simple something that is coming rather to a grant. So both condition and uh, uh, the, you know, that graded access to, say, for example, free bus ride that you raised, I think uh, is based on the belief that when these are not, these do not exist, people would behave irresponsibly. And I actually would like to contest that. I think there is a uh, judgment power that poor has, that women have, that young girls have, and it's possible that, you know, something that new comes, something that free comes, you start like suddenly the bus ride is free, I may, you know, I used to use my bus pass in JNU to take a free ride to that triple six that will take me to Delhi when I was new to Delhi because I wanted to know Delhi. I stopped doing that once I had my work. So, you know, when it's new, you want to 
try and that freedom and that affordability I did not have earlier. So you do that, but that's, that's minor. In the larger scheme of things, it actually contributes to your sense of freedom. It will bring a sense of responsibility, which would allow her to decide for herself and would make a lot of things that we want to uh, you know, happen through training her. I don't think that kind of training is needed. What we need is empowerment programs. You know, uh, many of us here uh, uh, in this room have been associated with programs like Mahila Samakya. Perhaps we do need that rather than bringing guidelines how to spend this money, how to spend that money, how to use this uh, uh, ticket and how to use that. So I think that, that's an important thing. Another thing that also, uh, you know, you talked about and I think it's important uh, uh, is that, you know, I think schemes, we have got lost in these schemes. If we look at mature societies and economies, what we need is reforms. So for example, health. We need reforms rather than new schemes. Education, we need reforms rather than new schemes that cost money. But you know, with these, all these, and Atik, uh, I think poor Atik, by coming here, you have the responsibility of representing the new government. And therefore, we all are addressing you. Um, since this beginning has been made, in a pure economic terms, I think we have these transfers, some perhaps uh, you know, supported by all, some not supported by all, but are addressing the demand side of it. We also have the responsibility to make the supply side of it, and that's what I think uh, uh, Mr. Sanjay Kaul was trying to emphasize, that we have to also do that. And But that, I think, uh, you have the luxury of next five years, and therefore some ref focus on reforms rather than just bringing new schemes uh, would uh, be a good thing and to also show that you know that's how you bring a shift in terms of uh, uh, political economy and also the whole uh, development thinking and live uh, similarly livelihood that 52 cro i know it's 30 uh, 35000 crores which would become more going to the economy would generate perhaps some livelihoods certain kinds of investments which would be of a different nature you know, if it's decentralized, we are talking of decongesting. So all that perhaps would happen, but would need support. And perhaps future budgets, you know, we also have now higher expectations of a different kind. So that is also there. The hopes and expectations are of a very different nature. Um, uh, one last uh, uh, point is also about transparency. I think there again, we have high hopes. And, and, uh, uh, and you know, because, Okay, let me say, the one way is uh, not to uh, show anything like you now we don't have census, we don't have uh, NSS, we don't have NMEI in next NFHS. So, uh, you know, we will not be able to talk about anything. So I think, again, Karnataka kar perhaps can show that, you know, uh, governance can be transparent and, uh, and something that also will be a political statement. Um, yeah, and I was surprised that uh, Sanjay didn't speak about housing. Because in his, and transport, I'm, I, I think that's the points you're making, you know, 200% with you. Flyovers and metros are not the solution. But housing, I think, is also one, a very, very important thing that you have raised in your book. And, uh, and especially living in cities like this, including Bangalore or any Indian city, where people uh, keep buying and, and uh, you have five flats and four of those are unoccupied. I, for one, uh, in a very responsible manner, I think actually we should have high tax for vacant houses, apart from in addition to property taxes. And those will be a good measure for, you know, corporations and uh, municipalities to raise uh, uh, money. So, uh, as, as, you know, as a person who has organized with my colleagues, I feel extremely happy with the quality of discussion. So thanks to all of you. And all of you, and, uh, uh, my colleagues, senior officials, former and serving who are here, civil society uh, members, academics who are here, uh, a small number, but critical and uh, critical number and very, very quality discussion. So thanks to all of you. And before we end, we have uh, um, yeah, just a token. Uh, So thank you and with this we uh, uh
close the lecture today. Thank you.